Because what's the books that most people read? It's popular books. It's books about vampires. It's books about Harry Potter. And so all of a sudden you're showing these kind of books that are unusual. But here's the point, is very quickly you can add some additional sophistication and take this and build that lightweight way to see if there's even interest in this functionality. And what the benefit of this is, is rather than building a heavyweight classifier and all the information extraction and all the other heavyweight lifting that you would normally need to build a full recommendation system, you can do it very, very quickly and have a test by just putting an ad slot on the page and put those, slot, those, those, uh, those images and links in there right away. And you'll get a sense of how what the click through is. So very quickly you've gone from a product that just has profile to get a sense of what that is. Now what's the difference of this in the frame of Dead Jiu Jitsu? We're taking a product and we're using elements of the product to make it very easy for us. What is a hard way of doing it, or is thinking of it as a big boulder and trying to crack that boulder slowly with a giant hammer, is we would have built the whole information extraction layer, the classifiers, information retrieval layers, some type of matching algorithm, you know, pick your favorite pick, and then finally deployed it. And that might take us several man years of effort to actually build out. And that's the whole point. We want to use a very, very lightweight way of thinking about things. So as we think about that, I want to walk through one of the things that I hear very often is what are all the different areas where analytics is applicable? And I would, they, these are sort of a frame way of, of thinking through the different parts of analytics. One is what I would call decision sciences and business intelligence. Another is fraud, abuse, security, and risk. Another is data infrastructure. And the final one is product market analytics. And what I'll go through is a number of case studies of companies that do very interesting things with this. So first, these guys that we call decision sciences and business intelligence. These are the people that understand the user and the usage. They figure out the click tracks. They figure out the segmentation. They prepare all the reports and the dashboards. They do special analysis to figure out uh, should you go, what's the next country you should uh, roll your product out in? Should you try to deploy a new product? What's the right phasing? And A-B testing as well. These are the guys that are all in that bucket, trying to understand those things. And so these guys are really the way, the reason we call them decision sciences, to the organization, if you're an executive, these are the guys you want the closest to you. They're the ones that help tell you, should you turn left or should you turn right? Should you step on the gas? Should you put on the brakes? These are the guys that you want in the meeting all the time. They want them doing analysis. And a good example of this is, uh, and where this is, is around this company called Netflix. And I'll say a little bit more about aviated testing in a second. But there's this company called Netflix, and this is primarily a US-based and now a Latin-based service, where there's, uh, a, a, you can basically get online DVDs, or you can get DVDs mailed to you very quickly. Now what's interesting is the system, the way this works is you first go there and they have a free sign-up process. And in that sign-up process, they try to do one thing. Anybody use Netflix here? It doesn't work here, right? <laughs> but if anybody's used it outside the US and you've signed up for it, the very first thing they try to do is they try to start getting you into, dropping you into this, this flow, this user flow, where they try to get at you to add all these DVDs to this instant queue list, this list that you want to keep, that, that carries a repository, a long list of all the videos you might be interested in. So anytime if you want to watch a video, you just click on that and it tells, it'll start pulling up that video. Why is that important? They were going through all their data and they were trying to say, well, what makes a user stay? What makes a user really stick around? What keeps them signed up? What keeps them give, bringing in dollars to the business? And they discovered they had a number of very interesting variables. One was the number of DVDs that are put into that queue or the, the number of streaming videos that people might be wanting to watch. There's also all sorts of other video things like the type of genres of movies that they're interested in, all this sort of stuff. And so what they decided was, well, how are we going to figure this out? Because now we have a lot of correlation data, a lot of correlated data that says we should be Things should be obvious to us that these are, are good variables to keep in mind for what is going to make this user stick around. But it's not which are the variables that actually lead to making them do that. What's correlated versus what's causation is the point. And so how do you figure out the difference between correlation and causation? 
And that actually comes back to this previous point of A-B testing. So what they did is they created a whole bunch of flows and they decided to test these different flows against each other to see which hypothesis was right. Which of the variables is correct? And one of the things that they found out in this process was that if you add seven movies to that instant queue, the probability that you are going to be a lifetime user for Netflix is off the charts, basically near 100%. So suddenly they realized one variable is a critical one, one of the most important variables. So now what they've done is through this process, they've optimized this, and the first thing that you get to do, here's a bunch of movies that you might be interested in. Add them to this queue. You get to that step, here's a bunch of other movies we think you might be interested in. Add them to the queue, until you get to seven. Once you're at seven, then it lets you really go on. And that's the whole point, because now they've figured out how to optimize a whole registration process so that they don't have to lose users later on in the business. Another example of this, which is more open in Russia, is a company called Zynga. Anybody play Farmville, Cityville, or any of those games? Yeah, those games are pretty popular. So what is something that they do there? There's actually a game called Fishville, and this was just actually put out there by Ken Rudin, um, who's another fantastic data scientist uh, over, over there. They recognized that in Fishville, there was one type of fish that was being bought at six times the rate of all the other fish. It's one type of fish. It happened to be translucent. Why? Who knows? But if you see one fish that's doing, what's a good thing to do? So the analytics guy goes, hey, you know what? This one fish, it seems to be a winner. Maybe we should go make more fish like this. So they put out a bunch of more translucent fish. And what happens? The overall spend on that game jumped dramatically by one data scientist recognizing that, hey, this thing is more, a lot of people seem to find this interesting. He found that insight. Then the business was able to take advantage of that insight, turn it into a product, and all of a sudden, now you have real dollars coming in. Now they do this day after day after day on all the products. And by the way, it's not just Netflix and Zynga, but Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, LinkedIn. We all do this day in and day out. And that's kind of this whole aspect of decision sciences and BI, where it's not just sufficient just to be creating dashboards and reports. That's absolutely essential because if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. But equally important is this ability to take your insights, to make insights, to translate them back into the business to get value, value added. Any questions about that? What, okay. does, what does it mean uh, AA tests? Ah, thank you for asking. So one of the things that AA tests are is the classic thing is you go try to do an AB test right away where you segment the data and you roll out the test. What happens is the first thing to do is actually pretend that there's an A-B test, but don't actually do an A-B test. So take half your users, put them in one bucket, take half your users, put them in another bucket. See what happens to the, met the metric that you're trying to measure. Because if they're doing two very different things, that means it's, your environment is not set up well to do an A-B test. Maybe you picked all the users that happen to be in one country versus another country. So we need to compare comparable. Exactly. So it means basically make sure your control group is a good control group or the population that you're testing across. Absolutely. But it's surprising. I'm glad you brought that up because the number of times that I've seen an A-B test happen where nobody did an AA test is incredible. And then when you actually go back and you actually mimic an AA test, you go, uh-oh, the data is totally useless. And the people are about to make million dollar decisions based on that without doing an AA test. So really important. Wow, we got some interesting music. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next area is what I call fraud, abuse, risk, and security. Uh, and one of the interesting things is, uh, and, and I contend is, the one of the big things that everyone does is, when you're trying to find where bad guys are in your system, who better to find that than the data guys? If you're looking for insights versus looking for bad guys, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. All the best fraud guys I've ever worked with have all been guys that are very, very good at manipulation of data, turning it, the data into insights and figuring out where stuff is there. A good case study of this is one of the ones, this is my LinkedIn graph with a with the hierarchical clustering on top of it. But looking at this network graph, what one that we were able to figure out is that there are lots of interesting ways 
to actually think about where bad guys are just by looking at network dynamics. And this is an idea that actually goes back to my time back at the, when I was an academic, is by looking at the networks, you can discern what looks like a healthy network and lo what looks like a bad network. And in fact, if I show you a good network and a bad network, or fraudulent network, you'd be able to say right away. It'd be very obvious. And in fact, I could train you that you could be able to tell anybody very quickly if this is a good, healthy network or bad network. And so with that, one of the things that you can do for systems like LinkedIn or Facebook or all these other type of network environments, or even in, when you're working in uh, national security against counterterrorism counter stuff, you can actually tell, are these networks good or are they bad? Very quickly. Now, that's not going to happen just through a generic risk type people. You're going to need data scientists to do that. The third area, infrastructure. One of the most important things. These are the guys that own the data warehouse. They help build tooling to support the team. How do you access data? And they build the distributed systems for moving data around. I think one of the organizations that has done a phenomenal job of this is Facebook, where at their organization, they have a model where they heavily invest in this team, and everybody else in the company is allowed to just go access the data through a system of Hadoop and Hive. And now they have this amazing thing where you know, a, a several, when they were, I can't remember exactly what, what remark, what level they had, but they had a phenomenal amount of their entire company writing queries against their Hadoop system using Hive. Now, you didn't have to go get a login to do this. You didn't have to go get all this craziness of, well, you have to know where the data schemas are, blah, 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 all this kind of convince your data guys to do this. They didn't have to go to somebody to, to do the analysis from them. They just do it themselves. All of a sudden, anybody can do analysis, can start looking at the data. And developing that rich data infrastructure allows that to happen. And one of the most important things that I see is everyone says, well, you get to pick one data system for your company, for your business. You get to use one. And to me, that sounds silly, because if a person comes to, come, comes to your house to fix your sink or fix your toilet, do you want them to walk into, in, into your building and say, you can only use one tool? You only get one, right? That makes no sense. So right? you want to use specialized tools for the right job, and so the way to think about that, this is just what is used at LinkedIn. So at LinkedIn, inside here, just look at the number of databases under here. So you got Aster, you got Hadoop, we use Oracle, we use MySQL. All of them. They're all used for very specific things. They're used in a way for what type of project you're actually trying to use them for. And in fact, if you want to know about many of our open source technologies, there's SNA, uh, SNA LinkedIn, I think it's SNA Projects. Uh, dot com, you can check out all the, the open source projects we've even released. Now, why do this? Well, it turns out systems like Aster and Oracle, fantastic for a SQL tier. Why is SQL tier important? Well, the marketing guys get tremendous benefit. And I'll walk you through a number of examples where the SQL tier is really, really valuable. But there's also, you need to do a lot of batch processing. Things, products like people you may know, things like uh, collaborative filter, a lot of the recommendation systems, they're best done at this Hadoop tier. So if you're going to try to build products for both of these things, you need both of those systems. And eventually what you need to do is you need to actually start getting sophisticated enough where you're using more of the cutting edge stuff. Product and marketing analytics. This is really where you start to turn data into product, turning it into, really into what I would call four major areas. The first one is facilitating the user experience and value proposition. Helping them understand for the user, even whether it's a, a web product, whether it's a product in the store, an enterprise product, or for internal customers. Why are they there? And one of the ways to do that is walk you through two use cases. This is a function on LinkedIn called People You May Know. You've probably seen it on LinkedIn, Facebook, a lot of other systems. This was actually invented at LinkedIn. This was invented by the analytics team at LinkedIn. And it was an idea that at the beginning people thought was not really a good idea. People actually thought it was stupid. Why did they think it was stupid? Because they said, well, we already have these address book importers. You can go there and you have your email and you can just upload it and we'll tell you everyone that's on one of these social networks. They also said, we have, we have kind of this index system so you can see, you can look up people. But think about that for a second. 
If you go to a large conference, you walk into this room, right, where everyone's hanging out outside, what's the first thing you do? 